I forgot to say this earlier. Middle schoolers, don't go anywhere. Sit with your parents. Listen, this is going to be good. We have the pleasure this morning of having a guest speaker, Dr. Russ Miller, who is a local apologist who loves to teach about how the Word of God is true and how it sets a foundation that we can build our lives on and that science actually agrees with it. And so, Russ, if you want to come on up. There you go. And Russ has been uh, speaking and teaching for many years. We uh, haven't had him here in a little while, about three years. He was here, uh, I think it was July 4th, actually, uh, of 2015. Mm -hmm. So it was that week anyways. Um, it was great. And so I'm so excited to have you here again, uh, sharing on Noah's Ark and dinosaurs, both, both of which I love. So it's exciting. And I'm going to go sit there with my kids and be like, <laughs> right? So uh, before you get started, let me just pray for you. Father, thank you so much for this opportunity for us to hear uh, from Dr. Miller. I pray that you would uh, open our minds, open our hearts, that we would uh, hear truth and then allow it to impact our lives. And Lord, that you would shore up the foundations of our faith, that we would trust you and that we would stand and lean and just live based on the truth of your word. I pray that you would be with Russ as he speaks. Just uh, give him clarity of thought, give him clarity of, uh, of words. Uh, and Lord, if there's someone here this morning that needs to uh, hear this and then move from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light, Lord, that they would be willing to open their mind, and open their heart to, to hear and to examine truth. And this would cause them to, to ask the questions that, that they don't want to ask. So, Lord, I thank you for people who are able to study uh, the Word of God and science uh, in different ways. And God, I just pray that you would be with us this morning. Thank you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right. Thank you, sir. You're on. How are you doing this morning? Awesome. Well, again, my name is Russ Miller, and my wife Joanna and I, she's got a bad cold. She's not here today, but we have a, a ministry we feel uh, God gave us to steward that we call Creation, Evolution, and Science Ministries. You might have guessed that. But we, uh, we came up with this name because sometimes we talk about creation and biblical accounts, and sometimes we talk about uh, evolution and Darwinian accounts, but we always try to tie these two religious beliefs into the scientific evidence. Oh, yeah, they're both religious beliefs. Yeah, I used to speak on college campuses quite a bit, and the professors used to really help me out by giving the kids extra credit to come there and harass and attack me. <laughs> and it was awesome because it'd fill up the entire auditoriums, and then I could just slaughter Darwinism with information they never would have seen had it not been for that. <laughs> Once one biology teacher saw that, quit her job, became a Christian, they stopped giving them extra credit to come there. She now teaches science in a Christian school, by the way. Because God's good. Because you know something? Real science is a believer's best friend. Real science. False science is a whole other issue. But you know, I used to go up to the podium and everyone would just be glaring at me with hatred. And, and God just showed this to me one night. I walked up to the podium and everyone's glaring at me. And I just said, hey, before I start, I want to ask all of you a couple of questions. How many of you have been taught that creation is a religious belief? And oh, man, it raised their hands. They weren't going to let me talk about religion on their campus, boy. I said, well, good, it is. It's a belief in how we came about. Hey, let me ask you another question. How many of you have been taught that Darwinian evolution is science? Oh, man, they raise their hands. They're there to defend science, boy. And then I just say, wow, you know, I, I'm kind of confused now because when I asked you if creation was a religious belief, you said yes. And I asked you about evolution, you said it's science. But aren't, aren't creation and evolution exactly the same thing? Aren't they both beliefs on how we came about? Oh, yeah. They are both beliefs on how we came about. Neither one is science. Real science is knowledge derived from the study of evidence. We all have the same evidence. So let's go ahead and get into this. Um, today, I want to talk today actually about the Word of God and that it's true, word for word and cover to cover. And that's, that's important to understand because the Bible tells us all Scripture is given by the inspiration of God. All Scripture well, that means word for word and cover to cover. In fact, Jesus told us that Moses wrote of me. In fact, through the inspiration of God, Moses is used to lay down the foundation of the gospel message in Genesis 1 and 3. If you're going to build a structure like this building, the first thing you have to do is you have to build a foundation or everything you build later is going to collapse. Well, God does the same thing through Moses. This is where we're told God gave us a perfect creation. You know, try to imagine that. It, it was perfect. There was no death. There was no suffering. 
honestly, that is beyond human comprehension. The more you try to, to, to think about that, the more mind-boggling it's going to become. Um, you know, today, we live in a world full of death and suffering. In fact, good scoffers, oh, they're going to come to Christian kids, and, oh, you believe in this biblical God who loves and cares about every one of us, right? Uh, yeah. Uh, knows the numbers of hairs on our head, right? And, which is easier for some people than others, by the way. <laughs> yeah, that, that's our God. Well, listen, my aunt's dying of cancer. Three kids were killed in a car accident in that intersection last night. We have wars, death, and disease reigning over the planet. Where is your loving God? Grow up. Well, you know, if that child doesn't know the biblical answer, they'll probably be one of the 87% of Christian kids that leave the church now by the age of 20. So if you leave here with nothing else today, know how to biblically answer that question. How can we have a loving God in this world full of death and suffering? Well, the answer is right here in Genesis 1 and 3. You see, the answer is God didn't give us the world the way it is today, full of death and suffering. God gave us a perfect creation. What happened to it was Adam's original sin. That original sin brought on the curse that allowed death to enter, and that's why we live in a world full of death and suffering today, yet have a loving God. It's a pretty simple answer, isn't it? It's been pretty much lost today. I'll talk about this a little more as we go. The reason is because of old earth beliefs. Now, I'll, I'll explain that in a minute. But this is actually just the, the answer is only the start of the answer. God gave us this perfect creation that was corrupted by Adam's original sin that allowed death to enter. But it, more importantly, that original sin separated us from our loving creator, requiring that we be redeemed with him. But see, the, the problem with this is there's nothing you and I can do to redeem ourselves because we'd have to be sinless, and we're not. We're, we all have a sin nature inherited from Adam. So because God loves us so much, despite our sin that separated us from him and corrupted his creation, he sent his only begotten son to suffer and die on a cross so that if we but believe in him, put our faith in Jesus, we spend eternity with him in heaven. Now that's a loving creator, isn't it? Despite ourselves. Wow, that's a loving God right there. Now Moses told, told us also, and this is actually the whole linchpin in the war of worldviews between um, humanism and biblical uh, uh, worldviews, is that God has judged man's sin once already with a flood that covered all the high hills under the whole heaven. <laughs> Come on, now that, that would be a global flood. Now, I'm going to be honest with you guys today. Is that okay? Can I be honest? Okay, if God's word were really true, I mean really true, and if there had been this flood that covered all the high hills under the whole heaven, I mean, wouldn't the evidence be overwhelming? I mean, I would think that um, if there had really been this global flood, if God's word were really true, I mean, the outer crust of the earth that we live on and walk on would be made up of sedimentary layers of rock stratified out by grain size, weight, and density laid down by water. You ever see a miner with a pan? He scoops up some sediments and some water. He sloshes it back and forth. Well, the moving water stratifies out the sediments by grain size, weight, and density. Well, on a global scale, I would think the crust of the earth would be all, all one like sandstone and then all shale and then all mudstone. You know, stratified out by grain size, weight, and density, not just mixed together in a big conglomerate. And I would think those layers stratified out by moving water would be full of billions of things that were drowned and buried in that year-long global flood so quickly they didn't even have time to rot away or get eaten by scavengers. So, well, what do we actually find today? Well, the outer crust of the earth averages a mile deep of sedimentary layers of rock laid down by water, stratified out by grain size, weight, and density full of billions of dead things that were drowned and buried before they could even rot away or get eaten by scavengers. <laughs> yeah, we call those things fossils today. Exactly what would be there if the Word of God were true. And you see, my friends, the Word of God is true, word for word and cover to cover. In fact, Jesus said, if you don't believe Moses, how are you going to believe my words? Why would it be important to believe Moses in order to believe Jesus? Well, let me give you an example. The humanistic religious worldview, which has been taught as if it were science in our schools now for the last, uh, let's see, 55 years, is based on the exact same sedimentary layers of rock laid down by water, stratified out by grain size, weight, and density. People ask me all the time, hey, Russ, what evidence do you have the Bible's true? I always say the same evidence that atheists use to say it's not true. Don't we live in the same world? Don't we have the same evidence? See, it's never been about the evidence. It's about who gets to interpret the evidence. 
Take those sedimentary layers stratified out at grain size, weight, and density. They just take the same layers. They say, wait, no, there was never a flood. This is foretold in 2 Peter 3, 3 through 6. In the last days, scoffers would deny the flood, by the way. And sure enough, starting about 210 years ago, they said there was never a flood. Those layers laid down by water formed slowly over millions and billions of years of time as you slowly evolved through millions of years of death without God. Exact same evidence interpreted through a different world view. It's not the evidence. It's who gets to interpret the evidence. But what this is teaching and it has been for 55 years now, is that death and suffering brought us into the world. There's, you know, the, the, Jesus says man was made since the beginning. First five words of the Bible, in the beginning God created, and the message is man's sin corrupted a perfect creation, allowing death to enter, separating us from God, requiring our redemption through Jesus. But these teachings are, no, it was billions and billions of years of death that brought you into the world. Do you see the difference? They're polar opposites, aren't they? But see, this is the foundation of the gospel message. So when someone asks you, well, how can we have a loving God? Well, the answer is God gave us a perfect creation that was corrupted by man's sin. That's the reason we live in a world full of death. They have a loving creator. But more importantly, that sin separates us from our, our creator, requiring our redemption with him. But there's nothing we can do to redeem ourselves. So he became flesh and dwelt among us and died in our place. Talk about a loving God. It doesn't get any more loving than that, does it? These teachings are teaching that all that is a bu bunch of malarkey. No, no, it was billions of years of death that brought you into the world. Death before Adam beliefs undermine the foundation of the gospel message. It's the reason I do what I do. Atheists understand this the best. This is from the editor of American Atheist. If there was never an original sin, he put death before Adam, you undermine original sin, there's no need of, Jesus, of salvation. And he said that puts Jesus into the ranks of the unemployed. And he's absolutely correct, by the way. I agree with that statement 100%. It's the reason we need to learn how to stand on the truth of God's non-compromised work. If the age of the earth is a problem for you, and it is for about half of Christians, I used to be a theistic evolutionist. I'm not, I'm not attacking anybody. I'm here to help people. It's just like somebody helped me. But if the age of the earth is an issue for you, I cover radiometric dating, carbon dating, Pangea, continental drift, the ice age, all in our global flood message, and show you how these things only fit a world that has endured a flood that covered all the high hills under the whole heavens. So why did God destroy his perfect creation? Well, back to Moses. God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and he said, I will destroy man. And then to the New Testament in 2 Peter, we're told he spared not the old world, but saved Noah the eighth person, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. There were eight people on the ark, four couples, Noah, his three sons, and their, their wives. So there were four couples on the ark, which is interesting because National Geographic did a study of the human genome and came to the conclusion all humans come from one of four distinct gene pools. <laughs> well, we could have told them that, right? They didn't have to do a study. They could just read, you know, the book of Genesis and come up with that. You know, if you started with four couples about 4,500 years ago, and if they averaged having 2.2 children per couple, you'd have 7 billion people on earth today. Since the studies say there are 7 billion people on earth today. Imagine that. Okay, well, here's a fair question. Hey, Russ, if there was really this global flood, wouldn't there be some flood legends floating about? Did you know that more than 300 ancient flood legends are known? Almost every ancient civilization begins with an account of a few people surviving a flood and repopulating the world. In other words, ancient history supports the word of God. Okay, well, how did Noah and his family collect those animals from all over the world? You know, there's just eight, eight, eight people in Noah and his family. There's a lot more than eight people here. If God told us we had about 120 or so years to collect animals from all over the world, and today we have airplanes and power boats and trucks, etc., I don't think we could do it. So how did Noah and his family do it? Well, they didn't. God had the animals come to Noah. Two of every sort shall come to thee, seven of the clean types. Okay. How did Noah and his family get all those millions of creatures on board the ark? Well, let's get a feel for maybe about how many animals might have been on the ark with Noah and his family. First of all, the Bible indicates he only had to bring land dwellers that breathe through their nostrils and some birds. So that gets rid of a lot of supposed issues. Fish wouldn't have been on the ark, right? Water-dwelling mammals like whales and porpoises weren't on the ark. Amphibians didn't have to go on the ark. 
Insects didn't have to go on the ark, etc. That gets rid of a lot of supposed issues. But more important than anything is this phrase. He only had to bring two of every kind, not two of every variety of a kind. You know, in the Ten Commandments, etched into a stone by God's very own fingers, we, we are told that for in six days the Lord made the heaven, the earth, the seas, and all that in the midst. You think that's important to God? He put it in the middle of the Ten Commandments. And we're told ten times in the book of Genesis, plants or animals will bring forth after their kind. Well, today, after millions of scientific experiments, the only thing that is ever found is kinds will only bring forth after their kind. See, Noah didn't have to take all 200 or 350 types of dogs on board the ark. He only had to bring two. They had the full canine gene pool, and they brought forth after their kind when they got off the ark. You know, I used to have a purebred yellow lab. The way breeders breed things is they use a process called gene depletion. See, the, the, this is microevolution. If you ask me, Russ, do you believe in evolution? I'd say micro, absolutely. This is the only thing real science ever finds. And it's caused by the sorting or the loss of the parent's gene pool. Gene pools get weaker and weaker. Uh, the way breeders use this to get purebreds is they breed out what they don't want. Purebreds lose. They lose everything. They, uh, yellow labs. You get purebred yellow labs, you have puppies, guess what they're going to be? Yellow labs. Because they've lost all the other information. You breed two mutts together, guess what the puppies are going to look like? <laughs> you, you have no idea because they got all sorts of genetic information in them. So this is micro. Darwinian macro would, requires massive amounts of new and beneficial information. Gene pools get bigger and better and better leading to macro change. So far, as of about 30 minutes ago, last time I checked, there's never been a single shred of evidence found of Darwinian evolution taking place. That's the reason secularists show you biblically correct micro kinds bringing forth after their kind and switch the discussion to macro, and people think there's all kinds of evidence for macro because they've been fooled. It's that simple. Real science is a believer's best friend. And if, if Darwinism is a problem for you, I cover this in our Science versus Darwinism in the textbooks message, causing AU to launch an accredited course attacking me and biblical creation. They ran for over four years. Um, one biology teacher, like I mentioned, quit her job, became a Christian. Uh, so real science is on our side. You know, this lower, lower right-hand corner, you see all the drawings? Do those things look familiar to you guys? They should. So you all been taught this when you were in school. That lower right drawing, uh, the, uh, the similar bone structure, they say, look, we have, we have two bones in our forelimb. A dog or a cat has two bones in their forelimb. Proof of all of all from a common ancestor. Well, can that be proof we have a common designer? I drive a Ford pickup truck. My next-door neighbor has a Ford van. Their dashboards are identical. Yeah. It's not because they evolved from a moped. Especially kids in school. Any kids still in school, high school, middle school, college, any argument of similarities proving Darwinian evolution is a better argument of a similar designer. Similarities are proof for a similar designer. Anyways, notice that their drawings also are, are their proofs for Darwinism are almost always drawings. There's an old saying that goes like this. Darwinists are experts at drawing things that never existed to support their theory that never took place. They might own the system. We own the evidence. It's that simple. But it's hard to get this information out. It gets blocked. Let's get back to the ark. How many creatures are on the ark? Well, there were about 2 million classified species today, but only about 40,000 are vertebrates. If you take out the marine creatures who would not have been on the ark and the amphibians and water-dwelling mammals who would not have been on the ark, you're left with about 3,000 kinds. Two of each kind is 6,000 animals. Throw in seven of the clean types, and you're looking at about 7,000 creatures on board the ark with Noah and his family. And the average size of a land dweller that breathes through its nostrils is the size of a house cat. So the question becomes, how did Noah and his family get 7,000 house cat-sized creatures on board the ark? Well, I'm just going to speculate a little bit here. Uh, I'm going to speculate that of the few large types, like elephants or giraffes, or the handful of large dinosaurs, God brought younger ones. They were smaller, way less, lived longer to reproduce. Some of you are looking at me like I'm crazy. A am I saying dinosaurs were on the ark with Noah and his family a few thousand years ago? Well, the Bible says he was to bring two of every sort. That would mean that they were on the ark. I'm going to um, mention that there were only about 50 kinds of dinosaurs. You know what the average size of a dinosaur was? 
about the size of a large sheep. Some were smaller than chickens. Of the handful of large ones, like the seropods, he only had to bring two. And I'm going I'm to speculate, God brought young ones, probably about the size of an Indian elephant. And so that would have been the largest animals on the ark. You know, the Bible says man and beast were both made on the sixth day. Now, I'm going to be honest, either the Bible's true or the Bible's not true. It's that simple. What's the first line you read to your children and grandchildren in a human, humanistic-based dinosaur book? They're going to go for their foundation right off the front. The first sentence, 65 million years ago, dinosaurs went extinct. Wow, you've just taught that child death and suffering existed for hundreds of millions of years before man. Later on, you try to say, tell that same child, by one man sin entered the world and death by man sin. And they're going, wait a minute, Mom, wait a minute, Grandma. You've been reading books that say death and suffering existed for hundreds of millions of years before man. Do you see the stumbling block being thrown up? Absolutely. Oh, by the way, the old earth beliefs were only invented 210 years ago. Did you know that? Yeah, that geologic column, 210 years old. But what this is teaching is what the Bible says is not true. And it undermines the foundation. It undermines that man's sin brought in death, separating us from God. Do you see that? So how do dinosaurs fit into biblical creation? That's a picture of my wife, Joanna, by the way. She's the pretty one with the white blouse on. Right? She's not here today. We'll just keep that little joke to ourselves. But let me, um, let me just ask you guys, let me just state, I think you'll agree with this, I'm going to show you some evidence. This is all after the flood evidence, okay? Post-flood evidence. But I want to agree that if dinosaurs had been extinct for 65 million or so years before man came along, there will be absolutely zero evidence of man and dinosaur having lived together, right? Do you all agree with that? And if they've been gone 65 million years, there'll be absolutely no evidence of any fresh dinosaur remains, correct? Okay, let's look at some evidence. And unlike the other side that only shows their side in, in schools, that's indoctrination, by the way, not education, I'm going to show you our side. You already know their side, so let's look at both. First of all, realize the word dinosaur was only invented 177 years ago. Prior to that, they were called dragons and serpents. If you look in a dictionary today under the word dragon, you'll be told mythical creature. Here's a dictionary not even 80 years old. It says dragon, now rare, a huge serpent, a fabulous animal. Go back in old dictionaries. There's nothing mythical about them. You know, we have ancient history books that are full of thousands of accounts of man and various dragons. We call those dragon stories today. Let me just give you two examples that come out of what is now India. You guys have heard of Alexander the Great? When he conquered that area 2,300 years ago, he said his soldiers were scared by the great dragons there 2,300 years ago. 1,900 years ago, Polonius of Tyana wrote, The whole of India is girt with enormous dragons, killers of elephants. It takes a pretty big critter to kill and eat an elephant, doesn't it? Obviously something different in the land of India 1,900 years ago. Now think about this logically. We find cave drawings, rock carvings, and carvings in brass and wood all over the world of various dinosaurs. Now picture this on a timeline. Here we are today. We're told these things were made from 500 to 2,000 years ago. But we didn't recognize dinosaur bones until 190 years ago. If we hadn't found dinosaur bones until 190 years ago, how come people all over the world know what they look like 500 to 2,000 years ago? I mean, it seems like somebody had to see them, right? This uh, cave drawing was found in New Mexico a few years ago of a duck-billed dinosaur. Uh, the duckbills all had these odd crests on top of their head. Now, this specific one was a Parasaurolophus. Notice the white crest coming off the top of his head. The interesting thing, we were told this was made about 1,200 years ago, the interesting thing is whoever drew it drew it striped like a zebra. Well, the Darwinists were scoffing at this. They couldn't have known it was striped like a zebra. They've been gone 65 million years. Well, then a few years ago, they found a mummified duckbill dinosaur in South Dakota. It was mummified. The skin was preserved, and it was striped like a zebra. Somebody had to have seen them. Did you know in the last 15 years, more than 50 non-fossilized dinosaur bones have been found? non-fossilized, that still have red blood cells, amino acids, and soft, flexible dinosaur tissues in them. How could they have sat there for 65 to 200 million years, right? 
So all those sedimentary layers laid down by water in which they're found, they were laid down by uh, <clears throat> water. You know, the word dinosaur isn't in the Bible. But I think God's describing a, a dinosaur here. The word dragons and serpents are mentioned about 25 times. But see what you think. He, he says to Job, Behold now behemoth, which means largest, which I made with thee. We were both made on the sixth day. He eats grass like an ox. Well, <clears throat> Some well-meaning theologians that have accepted the humanist worldview that dinosaurs have gone 65 million years try to explain that. Maybe that's an elephant or a hippo. Well, let's read further. His strengths are in his loins and belly. Strong loins and strong bellies. Well, elephants and hippos, they do have big, strong bellies. Maybe one of those is behemoth. This guy's got a big, strong belly. (laughs) If you want to be scientific, you have to look at all possibilities. But, you know, I think this is the guy that God's describing, the seropods, the largest land dwellers that breathe through their nostrils. He had to have strengths in the loins and belly to balance that huge, heavy, long neck and head and that long, heavy tail. Reading further, he moves his tail like a cedar. He had a tail like a cedar. That's not a tail like a cedar. (laughs) But, my friends, that is a tail like a cedar tree. And I think God's describing a dinosaur. So let me ask you a question. How many of you believe, like the overwhelming archaeological, biological, geological, and historical information attest, and like the Word of God says, that man and dinosaurs lived together in the past? How many of you can believe that? Absolutely. You'd have to deny all that information. You see, the, the, the belief they've been gone 65 million years is completely based on where they're found in the strata layers. If there was a global flood, it explains how the strata formed quickly, wiping out the humanist misinterpretation of the world. Hmm. Let me ask you another question. How many of you believe fire-breathing animals lived with man recently? Wow, there's actually quite a few. Wow, that's good. Just shows you're well-educated. But let me, let me show you guys something. If you send a kid off to college and they don't know how to defend this with a viable answer, and we don't have them to test, study, and observe today, though all we can do is come up with a viable explanation. Um, a good scoffer, and colleges are full of lots of them, professionals, they'll come up and say, oh, I understand you're a Christian. I might like to be a Christian, but uh, there's just one thing I can't get over. Maybe you can help me become a Christian. Well, yeah, well, how can I help? Well, you guys don't believe in fire-breathing animals, do you? Oh, no, that's ridiculous. Okay, let me go to Job 41, where your God says of Leviathan, none is so fierce, a flame goes out of his mouth. And by the next morning, that child will probably be one of the 87% of Christian kids that leave the church by the age of 20. Not because the Bible's not true, but sacrilegious on the system, and they're teaching all these things. And I can make it look silly real quickly, but I'm not in all those classrooms, see? So we need to, we, this is the reason we need to, you know, really teach some good apologetics for our children. Well, we don't have fire-breathing animals to test any observed today. Can we come up with a viable theory to explain them? Well, what about this? This is the bombardier beetle. Now, when he's threatened, he sprays an attacker with a chemical that is the boiling temperature of water, 212 degrees Fahrenheit. He was designed with twin chambers that store two volatile chemicals apart from another because if he was evolving slowly, the first time they touched, kaboom, that would have been the end of the bombardier beetle, but that's a whole other issue. So... When he's threatened, they go from his storage chambers to a combustion tube where enzymes are added, causing oxidation to take place, producing a chemical that is 212 degrees Fahrenheit, the boiling temperature of water, and he can spray this and hit an attacker right between the eyes with boiling boiling chemicals. He does this in one-tenth of a second. How long does it take you to boil water? (laughs) Talk about awesome biblical design, right? Well... What's that got to do with fire-breathing creatures? Well, what about this as a theory? Let's go back to the duck-billed dinosaurs, like the Parasaurolophus. They had odd crests on their heads. Now, nobody knows what the crest was for. Uh, Of the thousand or so guesses, it was a big olfactory, a big nose. It was a, a trumpet it used in the mating season. It was a sword it used to fight other dinosaurs. Nobody really has a clue. But it was filled with a complex series of passages, tubes, and chambers. Well, maybe those were storage and combustion chambers that store volatile chemicals apart from one another. And perhaps when he was threatened and he mixed these and they breathe them out and they hit the oxygen, well, perhaps a flame went out of his mouth. Now, it's just a theory. We don't have them to test, study, and observe today. Oh, wait a minute, but the Bible also talks about fiery flying serpents. 
fiery flying serpents. Here's a painting of St. Michael and the angels fighting what was called a wyvern about 560 or so years ago. It was a big reptilian creature with long leathery wings. Well, this is the Tronodon. It was a large reptilian creature with long leathery wings. Notice a huge crest coming out the top of its head. Nobody knows what the crest was for. It was filled with a complex series of passages, tubes, and chambers. Maybe those are storage and combustion chambers that store all the chemicals apart from one another. And perhaps when he was threatened and they mixed and they breathed him out and they hit the oxygen, perhaps we had a fiery flying serpent. It's just a theory. It's not there to test, study, and observe today, but I think we can believe God's word, right? You know, just north of Flagstaff is Wapaki National Monument of Native American ruins, and on the Wapaki is found this cave drawing of a fire-breathing dragon. We're told it's about 1,100 years old. Notice the huge crest coming off the top of its head. Hmm. Hey, let me ask you a question. How many of you can believe, like the Word of God says, and the overwhelming evidence shows that dinosaurs and even fire-breathing creatures lived with mankind in the past? Absolutely. And hey, my friends, <clears throat> I'm not here today to get you to un understand or believe that Man and dinosaurs lived together, or fiery flying serpents lived in the same era as mankind. I'm not here to get you to trust in Noah's Ark. I'm actually here to get you to understand and believe that no matter what God's word has to say, you can put your faith in it. If he says he's done something in the past or he'll do something in the future, you can put your trust in the word of God, word for word and cover to cover. Hey, do you think it was terrifying to live with dinosaurs? You think that they just considered us to be fast food? <laughs> Maybe not, not quite fast enough food? <laughs> well, actually, the answer is no. You see, the dinosaurs didn't eat people in the original creation. Okay, you've got to be thinking, come on, how could you possibly know that, right? Well, because the Bible tells us so. You see, to every, green, to every beast, God has given every green herb for meat. Remember, in the original creation, there was no death. There was no suffering. Plants were made to be the food source. Someone's going to come up to you and say, well, that means plants were dying. Plants didn't have a nephesh kaya, a living soul. Plants were made to be the food source. There was no death in the original creation. So dinosaurs didn't eat people in the original creation. Now, once Adam's sin corrupted the creation, things started falling apart quickly, but it's not the way that things were meant to be. It wasn't until Noah and his family got off the ark that God said, every moving thing shall be meat for you. So it's okay to kill and eat meat today, if you receive it with thanks to your biblical creator. But it wasn't until they got off of the ark. And in the nearing future, Jesus is going to give us a new heaven and a new earth where there will be no more death, no more pain, no more sorrow. We're going back to that perfect creation again where the uh, lion or the wolf will dwell with the lamb and the lion will eat straw like the ox. So I tell people, if you like eating chicken or halibut steaks or you like deer hunting with your dad, you need to get it in now because... It's not going to be that way in the new heavens and the new earth. You ever heard of prehistoric animals? Hey, do you know that giant fossils of various creatures like buffalo and pigs and 90-foot-long and cattail reeds and, and large insects are found in the fossil record, and they call those prehistoric and shovel them off to the side and don't talk about them because they're an embarrassment to Darwinism. It says things are evolving bigger and better. They're actually pre-flood animals, not prehistoric. They're pre-flood you know that seven-foot-long sea scorpions have been found fossilized? Six-foot creatures like lobsters have been found. Um, Two-foot-long grasshoppers have been found. In Germany a few years ago, they found a nine-foot-long fossilized centipede. Yeah, you guys have centipedes down here, right? How long are they? Maybe, yeah, that big? What, what about if a nine-footer came out of here? <laughs> It'd be everybody for themselves, right? Wow. Yeah, in fact, they found a, an 18-inch fossilized cockroach. Ooh. Imagine you open the counter up in the morning, get your cereal out, and an 18-inch cockroach jumps out at you? Wow. The kids could put a collar on them and walk them around the block, you know? Be a great pet. Your moms would love that, I'm sure. So, but these are pre-flood, not prehistoric. You know, nobody knows what happened to the dinosaurs. There's about a thousand theories. The most popular for the last 40 years, although it's lost most of its scientific standing in the last five years, but it's what most people believe because this is what they were told, was a meteorite struck the planet, caused the blackout, the plants died, the animals died. 
But, you know, we find creatures alive today that we find their skeletons with, with the dinosaur bones. You know, I have a theory that actually fits the evidence. I think that a few thousand years ago, God judged man's sin with a flood that covered all the high hills under the whole heaven, laying down stratified layers separated by grain size, weight, and density, so we can find the dinosaur remains today that are non-fossilized that still have red blood cells, uh, soft, flexible tissues, amino acids, and two years ago, they even found dinosaur DNA in some of those remains. There is no way those biological materials could have lasted more than a few thousand years at the most. Yet tonight, kids will go to sleep all over the world, and the last thing their loving parents or grandparents are going to read to them starts out, 65 million years ago, dinosaurs went extinct. You've just taught that child death and suffering existed before man. Satan's seed is being planted. And the enemy that sowed the lies is the devil, and the harvest will be the end of the world. Think about this from Hebrews 11, verse 7. By faith... Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, he lived in a world where it probably hadn't even rained. And God tells him to drop his career, his hobbies, everything he's doing, and spend 120 or so years building this huge ark because there's going to be a global flood in the world where it hadn't even rained. Well, he moved with fear. That means with respect to the word of God and prepared an ark to the saving of his house and became the heir of righteousness, which is by what? Faith. We're supposed to have what? Faith. Faith in the word of God. Word for word. And cover to cover, my friends. And the Lord finally said to Noah and his family, after around 120 years, we don't know the exact time frame, come thou and all thy house into the ark. And they went in, as the Lord had commanded them, and God shut the door. Now, up until that instant, anyone in the world was invited to walk up that one narrow plankway through that one and only door into God's one and only plan of salvation from that coming global judgment. And of estimates from 100 million to a billion people, only eight people put their trust in the non-compromised word of God and became the heir of righteousness by faith. And the global flood burst forth upon the earth as the fountains of the deep erupted. A lot of people think the water came from above. A little did, but most came from below when the fountains of the deep erupted. This eventually separated the continent and led to what we call continental drift today, which happened toward the end of the flood, not slowly over never seen millions of years at time. Think about this from Jesus. He gives us a warning here. He says, before the flood, people were eating and drinking and marrying. They were just going about their lives, but they were ignoring the word of God. They were scoffing at Noah and his family of believers, probably cursing them and just going about their, their everyday lives without God in it. And they didn't know until Noah entered in the ark, and the flood came and took them all away. But then it was too late. And he says, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Jesus is going to return at a time where the world's going to be pretty much walking away from him and his truth, ignoring his word, scoffing at believers, going to football games or this or that instead of church. And, you know, that's when Jesus is going to return. And it's going to happen in the twinkling of an eye. So, my friends, the time to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior was 20 years ago. If you hadn't done it then, it was 10 years ago. If you hadn't done it then, it was yesterday. If you have not accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you need to get right with Jesus soon. Because I think we're living in days that are like the days of Noah yet again. The purpose of our ministry is to teach about creation, evolution, and age of earth issues to expose false anti-biblical teachings in order to provide a reason for the hope that's in the heart of all true believers and all true seekers. And we do this through our various teachings. I think 14 of my messages, all my Grand Canyon rim tours, etc., all on our DVDs. We have a Grand Canyon film that won Grand Runner Up at the San Antonio Christian Film Festival a few years ago. It's on our DVDs. 50 of our Q&A, top questions and answers are on there. I don't copyright my DVDs. I never have. I asked God years ago, how do I get this information out? It gets blocked by just about every side. You would, you'd be shocked if you knew who all blocks this information. And the answer I got two days later was, don't copyright your DVDs. Tell people, make copies. One woman got a set of our DVDs in Oregon about five years ago, went out and bought a tower copier. She has given out more than 500 complete sets. 
covers and all. I've spoken in 12 churches in Oregon and three churches in Washington as a result. Last year, I spoke in three public high schools in Oregon, and I spoke in the science auditorium at Eastern Oregon University, all because of fruit coming from this one woman's desire to get this truth out to people. It's made a big impact up there. My book, The Cost, covers the top 10 old earth beliefs, the top 10 evil fruit of old earth beliefs. Number one is Darwinism. Darwinism is a fruit coming off the old earth tree. Old earth beliefs, 210 years old. Darwinism, about 155 years old. And I cover the top 10 Darwinian beliefs and the top 10 proofs of biblical creation and the flood. Real easy to, to read, understand terms, quick to the point. And I show, here's the evidence, here's the secular interpretation you've all heard. Now here's that same evidence for a biblical interpretation. And you will see why the other side that owns the system will not let you see a biblical interpretation. If you did, there would be, it's a, what I call a no-brainer. And I have uh, coloring books with a lot of information on Noah's Ark and dinosaurs and on our Christian heritage. Because as a, in fact, it was the message, uh, Mike, I gave, I think, uh, uh, July 4th, a couple, three years ago, endowed by their creator. You see, as American citizens, your, your freedoms don't come from our government. Your freedoms come from the fact you're endowed by your creator. And we've been teaching the last 55 years of our citizens there's no creator. And if you look at the world today and say, what in the world is going on? That's the start of your answer right there. You know, Grand Canyon, I take about 1,000 people a year on Grand Canyon tours. I should have talked to you guys about doing a Grand Canyon trip from here. But uh, how many of you have been to Grand Canyon? What did you think when you first saw the original creation rock? Wasn't that awesome when you realized that? Oh, nobody showed that, pointed that out to you. Um, you saw it. What did you think when you first saw, realized where the first flood layer comes in and lays right on top of the creation rock? Wasn't that awesome? Where creation and judgment physically met. Oh, nobody showed that to you. When you're on the rim looking down, it's a mile from the rim down to the river. What they won't tell you there, that one mile is nothing. There used to be two miles of strata above the rim that had been removed all the way to the sea, leaving behind what's called the Grand Staircase. The 2,500-foot pink cliffs of Bryce, the 2,500-foot cliffs at Zion, you drop down to the 2,000-foot tall Vermilion Cliffs, and then you drop down just north of here, the 2,000-foot tall Mogollon Rim. That's a gigantic erosional event that can only be explained by a global flood. But a global flood explains how the strata form quickly, wiping out every old earth belief, so they just don't talk about it. So join us on one of our trips one day, because Grand Canyon and the Staircase are monuments to the truth and the authority of God's Word. Let me end with this from the book of John. We're told that in the beginning was the Word, and all things were made by Him. So the Word of God is our Creator. The Creator is the Word of God. Do you see that? And we're told the Word, our Creator, was made flesh and dwelt among us. The Word of God, our Creator, is who? Jesus. Jesus is the Word of God, and He's our Creator. Now, Jesus also called Himself the Bread of Life, so He's the Word of God and the Bread of Life. But when tempted by Satan, Jesus said that man will not live by bread alone, but by every word from the mouth of God. And my friends, that means word for word and cover to cover. And that includes the first five words of the Bible, which read, in the beginning, God created. My friends, you can believe those first five words and every word thereafter. Word for word and cover to cover. Put your faith in the non-compromised word of God. Let me end with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you uh, for this morning and every dear soul that's here today. I thank you for the leadership of this church. I hope and I pray that the information we share today will be a blessing and give us more information to share with others. Um, and um, I do ask you to let us take this forward and, and share it and bring people a saving faith in you. The Word who became flesh, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's in your great name I do pray. Amen.